Welcome everyone to this presentation, macroinvertebrates.org, a virtual tool for learning and teaching macroinvertebrate identification. This is the second presentation of two on this topic, with the first presented by Marty Lowe from Carnegie Mellon University on the history and background. So be sure to check out that presentation located on the website. My name is Tara Mintz. I'm an aquatic ecologist and currently Stroud Water Research Center's Assistant Director of Education and Administrator for the International Macroinvertebrate Monitoring Program called the Leaf Pack Network. And I've been involved with this project coming from the lens of a trainer, environmental educator, and ecologist. And I'm excited to share with you in this next presentation um, all those resources, materials, tools, and training and techniques in my, that myself and the project's co-design partners have created as a result of our research discoveries and pilot trainings with these new tools. So we'll take a dive deeper into all of that. And we'll also take a tour of the resources available where they can be used in a training environment to help learners learn to see and see to learn. Plus we'll share a few ideas of how teachers can bring in the site with students. Speaking of research, in 2016, this project led a national survey of trainers and macroinvertebrate ID. So we asked trainers about such things as their organization's goals, how do they use volunteer macroinvertebrate data, what are the resources and materials used in a training, and overall, what does the training environment look like, and those best practices trainers incorporate. We had a large response and published those responses in a tech report that can be found on the project's website. We'll also be publishing a manuscript on those findings later this year. So briefly, what were some of those findings? As for the desired level of ID, most asked their trainees or volunteers to ID to the level of order with some families. And then we asked, would you like to train volunteers at a deeper level taxonomically and have them ID at that level? And this is where we got a mixed response with half stating they were comfortable where they're at and the other half wishing to go at least family level, if not deeper to genus. And so with these results, you'll see, you know, the site's very helpful to family level and can be supportive to that family level wish of IDing deeper. Um, and all the site, site, all insect specimens are identified to the genus level, although that collection is not exhaustive for all of Eastern North America. So one last sharing from this survey, and this relates to the materials and resources used during your training. As you may have guessed, there are many different tools that are brought into that experience. So here's a summary list of 20 different items, with those at the top being used most often and those at the bottom hardly at all. What was interesting to us are those tools highlighted in yellow, not often used, relate to some kind of technology whether it's scopes, cameras, videos, website, or mobile applications. And so this was interesting to us and kind of some leverage to encourage the use of this website even more. So as we had mentioned in that other presentation, there are a lot of benefits to using this site, such as high quality imagery that brings a specimen in such close view, you feel like you're looking through a scope without having to. There are videos and interactive keys, voice recordings, and other ways to engage besides just clicking on the pages. And the site offers many ways to see and to learn. Again, for a more universal holistic approach to learning. And there's much support for ID, tips, pointers, guides. And then the site really has a strength, as I mentioned, to go to family level of ID if interested. And one question I know may be concerned that many people might have is, can I use this site without having an internet connection? And the answer is yes. And so that's a huge benefit. And we'll show you ways in which to um, engage with the website offline. So to note, um, and now, sorry, we'll, we'll show you exactly how to do that and use these resources by taking a look at that um, the resources that are available, where to bring these into that training environment, but also if you're doing a community event like an exhibit table or student program, many of these resources can be used for that scenario. So um, as a reminder to note here, also there is a designated resources section of the site, which you can find here on the left side of the screen through the navigation bar. 
There are currently 14 different resources to tap into from customizable presentation decks, printable materials, image galleries, rack cards, an introduction video, student activities, and more coming. So now I'll go into some of these a bit deeper. I'd first like to point out that there is a trainer guide available, which is also good for teachers, um, with tips and more in-depth information on using the site for trainings, um, but also considerations for your training environment and what a learner needs in order to have a favorable learning environment. So these are to help alleviate what, was ref what is referred to as those bottlenecks to learning, which can be anything from stumbling on the lexicon, especially with morphology, uh, navigating the website to getting enough confirmation on ID to feel confident. So here are a few of those tips with the first two kind of focusing on the site. So number one, of course, um, you yourself need to be the master of the website. So take some time to learn the navigation of the site, what is available, um, how to um, search through different pages so that you can help others um, navigate it's a, so it's a smooth process. Number two, don't use the site only during the day of a training or a class, but bring in many exposures to the tools here and make it more than just a one day experience. So maybe before and after a training over multiple classes. Um, so this creates repetition and foundation building a scaffolding approach. And the remaining tips here are offered to assist with the efficacy of a training. And some of these you may do already, such as number three, offering many ways to learn and see. So that visual variety from keys to flashcards, preserved to live specimens, and now a technological piece. Number four, build a good portion of a training around confirmation of IDs, giving a lot of time for this. So practice, 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 and confirm, confirm, confirm IDs. Number five, if you feel comfortable, offer additional learning experiences of the taxa, and this is specific to maybe a volunteer experience to keep that volunteer engaged and excited to participate. So you might be interested or try to offer um, to co-host a family level workshop just on caddisflies or mayflies, for example, and I'll give example um, one of these types of workshops later in the presentation. Number six, one of the biggest bottlenecks to learning um, a new group of taxa is the scientific lexicon. So have um, a learner learn that lexicon, but also know that it's okay for them to put things into their own language so they remember it. It's okay to say, for instance, crunchy body instead of sclerotized body. And last but not least, number seven, which feeds off of number six, is one way to learn that lexicon, which is important for ID, is the morphological characters. So they need to start there and learn those. And a good way to start this um, is to actually engage in the key. So the key is on the website. It goes to order level for insects and also includes some non-insects that you'll see on the right. <clears throat> there are two versions of this, one which you can use while connected to the internet and is interactive and one that you can print from the resources page and laminate if you'd like. The online version is similar to many dichotomous or flat keys, you know, as a decision tree approach, but it addresses one big bottleneck that you found, we found in our research, which is locating a morphological characteristic. So as you go through the key, you might come upon one of these questions and a user may say, I don't know what a wing or a wing pad is, but what you can do is click on that blue box with a plus sign, and it'll bring up that morphological character with some definitions and pointing out where it is. It's a pop-up. So, um, so this, one of the training tips I mentioned, you know, was to alleviate this bottleneck. And then also another tip was to engage attendees prior to a class or a workshop. And so using this key can be one of those ways. You can email them an image from the website's gallery, which doesn't have an ID, have them try to ID it with this key, get some practice in, and get comfortable with morphology and lexicon ahead of time. So next are the full order sheets, one of my favorite resources. And these are um, only for the EPT, so that Ephemeroptera, mayfly group, plecoptera, stonefly group, trichoptera, caddisfly group. So these are meant, um, you can use these for printing or you can put them into a virtual experience in a presentation. 
And again, you know, these, if you print them, they're a really good resource to use offline at a training event if you wanted to go, say, dive deeper into any of these three orders. So in this case, um, one of these sheets is, I'm showing you the Tricopter Caddisfly version, which is actually two pages, and is a great way to get, again, an overview of the order all in one place. And here we see, on this side, a life history summary, a character list, um, and then we've got all the case makers, which are just beautiful in themselves to view, and the website is also set up to look at all just the case makers as well, if you were interested. And then on the other side, you see the free living and net spinning caddis flies plus a morphological diagram, an image of an adult, and then an order overview. So the design team has also pulled together. We've all created this beautiful poster, which you can print and laminate to have at a training. And it's, again, it's one way to see images of the possible community you may encounter while monitoring a stream. Um, these are also great up in a classroom. We've had professors put them up in their entomology labs and they're really useful at public events. And as shown in the intro video, these beautiful illustrations are available as well as a gallery of images um, to use for non-commercial purposes. So feel free to make your own flashcards or printable materials out of these images. And these particular ones are touched up and really easy to use. Um, they've had a little bit, um, like I said, more of a touch up done to their outer edges, but you can use any of the images that are on the website. So one of the trainer tips was to engage attendees prior to a workshop or if you're a teacher prior to a class. And the resources you see here are a great way to do so. So you can send ahead of time um, this quick start guide and have um, students or attendees, you know, volunteers watch the intro video and that way they'll be one step ahead of the game. When they arrive to your workshop, they'll have had some navigation experience at the website and also an introduction to macroinvertebrates. And as you saw on the video, um, if you've watched it already, the intro video, there is a nice way to build confidence through the online practice quiz or game. So again, this can be a way to engage an attendee um, after a workshop and keep them practicing IDs. So this is made for the volunteer level and if we're able to secure funding in the future, of course we'd be very interested in making these practice quizzes by order level too. All right, the last resource I'd like to share with you before we dive into some workshop examples and student classroom examples is um, this trainer slide deck presentation deck, which is absolutely customizable for your particular selection of taxa, could also be used in a classroom setting for teachers, um, can be used in workshops, university courses, and again, student classes. It covers the major taxa groups, uh, tips for ID and learning, as well as how to take care of live macroinvertebrates. So I'm gonna show you some ex slide examples from that presentation deck now. And this one goes over tips for diving into IDs such as paying attention to size ranges, starting slowly one order at a time, and being aware of NSTARS and life cycle phases. There are additional slides that go into some of these a bit more in depth, so, and I'm sure you can add more to this list. We also have a slide on general sensitivity groups and the subsequent taxa slides are organized as such as you see here. So they, we have slides that go into each one of these taxa deeper. Um, but again, you can rearrange this view according to your sensitivity groupings in your region. But it's a great slide to send ahead of time as a PDF or actually have printed at the workshop for each attendee to reference. Um, and this slide covers a topic that is near to my trainer heart, those taxa that are commonly misidentified. So I'm sure many of you and I've done this, like we've often seen these mistakes, you know, for example, confusing mayflies and stoneflies because they look so similar. But there are, you know, there are also several groups that aren't listed here that I'm sure you could add to because this is not exhaustive. So um, please email us if you have any others that you would like to add to this and our intentions again with a slider to open that bottleneck up where a learner may get stuck or confused on ID. So following that slide is our slides like this 
um, that review more in depth to question why are they different. So this particular one goes over riffle beetle, caddisfly, and other beetle larvae and why they and how they're different. Here is one of those taxa specific slides that presents the common and scientific name. Here we've got a mayfly at the top, sensitivity and taxa similarities at the bottom, images and our drawings on the right, and ID and life history information on the left. And we've also included that awesome gallery of images of morphology um, characters, morphological characters um, from that web from the website. We've put them into this slide deck as well. So these point out, you know, particular characters just in different views. So, and in a gallery view of multiple views. So these are great um, to go along with the presentation. So now I'd like to share three workshop examples, um, ranging from 40 minutes to a full day, from novices to those that have some ID skills and some examples of how to use the site also for student learning. So in example number one, this was a very short intro to the website and overall to macroinvertebrates as part of the Pennsylvania Master Naturalist Annual Conference. Many attendees had not heard of aquatic macroinvertebrates or had much experience with them, so this was a lot of fun. I showed the intro video to the website, um, and with provided laptops and hand lenses, I had them ID an unknown preserved specimen using the site's online key. I created a worksheet for them to use, and this is on the site also for you to use, and had this you know, as a think-pair-share experience. They were to try their hands at identifying the specimen, then they could check the answer key to confirm, and then either they could draw or write down the key characters that got them to this final ID and add a fun factor to all found from the website. So they shared this then with a neighbor and then the entire group of about 20 attendees that we had. So this is something simple you can do as a basic macroinvertebrate introduction with adults or even middle school age students on up. And again, this form is on the resources page if you would like to use it. Another activity you can use to introduce the website is a worksheet also found on the resources page, which engages attendees in navigating the website to look up specific characters of a few orders and families. For this activity, you'd first show the introduction video, and the only other supply you really need is this worksheet, um, a writing utensil, and the website. So you can supplement the activity for doing this in person with some preserved specimens, a hand lens, or scope just for fun, but it's definitely not needed. And um, here you would have a participant, we'll first compare two orders. Here we've got Ephemeroptera and Diptera. And I picked uh, to start with just two very different orders to start off to make it kind of easy, but you can of course alter this and change this as you wish. If you'd like to do two very similar orders, that may be very um, helpful too. Um, and then they go to two families of these orders, so Heptogeneidae and Simulidae. Um, they'll answer the worksheet's questions by using the website entirely. And this activity can take around probably 10 to 15 minutes. You can probably make it extend more if you'd like. And then I put some pictures here also of two example specimens of these orders and families. Um, this can also be a think pair share experience and can be used for a grade or as an activity in a workshop. And I, like I said, you can change the orders and families if you'd like. So example number two um, was a workshop for Trout Unlimited and we trained volunteers in their cold water conservation core kicksane method and then trained them also an ID to order in some family level so that, um, you know, typical volunteer level of ID. So this was an all day training and we plugged into the website, but we also used materials from the resources page like offline with offline activities. Um, we prepped attendees ahead of time by emailing them links to the site's introduction video and um, to the ID key to help get familiar with the site to build their foundation. And then um, at the training, I used the new slide deck for all the intro materials and 
um, catered it to this particular method of, of collection as well. And then um, in the morning for about 40 minutes before he really went into the field and saw live specimens, I built in some time for using the site to practice ID with preserved specimens. So we had attendees bring their own laptop or smart pad. And so they had just some time to be with the site, be with the preserved specimen and use it and try to start getting into some ID. Uh, once we, then we went out in the field and once we came back from our live ID, there was really no room on the tables for laptops. They could probably use smart pads. Um, but we had a few of the actual dichotomous keys printed out for their use. And so that was really helpful too. And then as a follow-up um, to the workshop, we sent an email with the quiz, a link to the quiz, and then encouraged attendees to keep at it with their ID. So that was using the site before, during, and after an experience, which we thought was a little bit more useful and thorough. <laughs> For this last workshop example, number three, we dove into the Trichoptera order. This was a lot of fun. Um, we held this workshop at the Stroud Center with myself and a colleague from the entomology department. We created a lot of new materials for this day, include, and most of these are on the website that you can access. Um, we did include and make them a small manual that we printed out for each attendee that had a key to the families, and we kind of collated this from different keys. Um, and this ended up being a four hour workshop, which really could have been all day, if not two days, but we did focus on just a few um, caddisfly families, so a small subset, and had live and preserved specimens already available and pre collected, as well as scopes. And uh, the Carnegie Mellon University Design and Learning Research Team and our external evaluator were there and conducted their research to see how attendees were using the site during the workshop and to gain feedback on its design. And again, we brought out um, many materials to assist in the learning, um, including you know, that order level sheet. And we also created more of our own. So here you can see, um, let me go back. Here you can see we have what I call ID worksheets. And these are on the families that, um, subset of families that we went over that day. So here, a learner could record in their own voice and way of thinking notes on ID features. Again, this would just be in their own language and also what they may have seen at the site. They could also circle parts of the body and just draw, 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 and just use different ways of like really diving deep into some of these families and then they could keep these for records for later um, and refer to them. I also created what are called uh, focus sheets. And so this one is available on the website as well. And you can make more of these. We didn't make them for every single group, but this is just for this particular order. And the idea of this was to learn the morphological characters for an order and then get practice learning for a family. So again, these are helpful for a person just getting into aquatic macroinvertebrates, starting to learn morphological terms and get them to understand what to look for and record this on a worksheet in their language. So I created this one for the workshop, like I mentioned, to begin the connection to caddisfly morphology. So um, these attendees had had some experience with macroinvertebrates before, but we're diving now deep into one order. So that's what this was for. So you start by navigating. Um, so you have to have laptops and access to the website so they would you know, navigate to the Trichoptera on the website with the goal to figure out three characteristics that make a caddisfly a caddisfly and list those in the upper right hand corner. So that's the worksheet you see at the top in blue. <coughs> and then the bottom worksheet on red, so this would be like a two page worksheet. Um, then you have a participant navigate to family level in this case was hydrocycidae and so complete the three characteristics that get you to this family um, looking at the arrows and the numbers and so they cues the website so this is just something to get the brains moving to thinking about what body parts do i need to look at um, for the caddisfly so those are just a few examples of how to bring in the website and resources into a training so that's this answer key for that particular um, worksheet. So lastly, I'll end with ideas of how you can use the site with students of 
all ages from elementary grade bands to college level and for whether your classroom is indoors or outside, in person or virtual. So let's start at the university level where there was a faculty member at <clears throat> Susquehanna University's Freshwater Research Institute here on the East Coast in Pennsylvania, US. And that was, um, that person was connected to this project and brought in the website in multiple ways for this past 2020 spring aquatic entomology course that he taught. He was already bringing in the site in many ways, which I'll share here in a minute, but even more when courses um, this past spring needed to go online with the pandemic. So this was a 14 week um, two credit course, which met for three hours a week. It was a lecture lab hybrid format. And when going online, they used Blackboard for delivering the course. For the lectures, he used the following tools from the website, including the trainer slide deck um, with modifications as needed, the morphology gallery to point out key character features like one tarsal claw for the mayfly, all the drawings for the EPT, um, the image actual gallery, and then lastly, the online quiz was included in his final. So students for that final were to ID 15 specimens in the quiz. And the quiz is an unending. You can take it as long as you want. So you have to end at some point. So he just said, take, uh, do 15, ID the 15, and then take a screenshot of your final score because it'll um, tell you how many out of how many you've gotten correct and then take a screenshot and send it in. So that, that was um, one experience with his students. As for uh, lab exercises, this is where he got really creative. Some of these activities occurred before the pandemic and able to do in person and others occurred afterwards. So for all the labs, students used the site for confirmation of IDs, which was a big factor in making this course successful of being able to see specimens so closely with um, a labeled ID. One of the activities um, in person included pairing students, giving them a few preserved specimens that had taxonomic challenges, such as um, confusion with, you know, a damselfly with three tails, similar to a mayfly that might have three tails, and caddisflies where the families could be really hard. So students were also given four different keys, such as Merritt and Cummins, Vichel, Karski, and the macroverbus.org flat key. And they were to use all these keys and outline uh, the couplets to get to the first, you know, to first order level. And then they had to use all these keys to get to family level. So they also needed to do a search on certain questions regarding life history, such as tolerance levels, functional feeding groups, habitat, et cetera. Um, and in most aquatic entomology course students, they'll need to create you know, some kind of voucher collection. So in this case with the pandemic, that was not possible to collect lives. So he assigned students to find 30 images of, um, from the list that he created and he, they had to find these online. So 20 of those on the list could come from macroinvertebrates.org. Um, and then there were some restrictions as to how many could be insects from this list and non-insects, and then 10 orders on that list need to be um, represented. So um, Matt Wilson, the faculty teaching this course, was grateful to have the site at hand for that. And as you can imagine, probably thrilled when this course ended, but that was great to come up with all of those um, potential outlets and activities that went really well. All right, a way in which I have brought the site into teacher trainings and also AP environmental science high school student programs is through an ID and biotic index activity that I'll walk you through here briefly. I used a simulated sample from a real site's data. So I had students get into groups, I introduced the site to them, showed them the creek that this sample quote unquote was coming from. They had to ID the sample um, from images and they could use the website and more and confirm them and then put them to score the stream. So how did this look? Um, again, first you introduce the site a bit virtually. Um, so I had images and videos of the creek that these came from. And we had real data from this creek too, which was great. And then you show 
a slide of the, again, the sample. Again, this is, you know, what we might actually find at that creek, White Clay Creek here on Stroud's campus. So each student or teacher um, will be assigned a letter of an individual to ID. And I did send this slide ahead of time so that each person has this in their view and they have it on hand. And then they can click on the hyperlink, which goes to a video playlist um, on the Leaf Pack Network website. So there are quiz videos there that are not ID'd um, right off the, the bat. So that was really helpful. So you can access those videos too. And macroandpurpose.org also has videos, but the ID is um, right there. Um, so, you know, I provided a different online keys than for them to use if they didn't have one in person. And one is from macroandpurpose.org and the other was from the Stroud Center. But there are also, you know, many apps to use that you could um, have them access, such as one from the Audubon and one from Isaac Walton League. So after they like ID'd their specimen, um, we came back as a group and went through each ID and to see what they got and go through the answers and discuss what may have been challenging or if the ID was um, incorrect, like why, and worked as a group together to ID. And then we just tried to clear up those bottlenecks. And then after that, we'd have them together, you know, or in those groups again, break out, depending on their ages, fill out an online version of the biotic index. And this is from the Leaf Pack Network um, that you can find on that website. Um, so we'd go through this together. And there, again, is another version of this that you can access on Leaf Pack's um, website. Let me show you right here. It's called the biotic index calculator. So you can just plug in, it's um, a form that they can use and just enter all the data there. So after you've ID'd everyone, all your taxa in that group sample, you can just go through it this way or you can go through it this way together. So with elementary level students, in this case, fourth graders, we've supported teachers in lessons on adaptations. And this is a 50 minute experience. And we've also brought this adaptations idea into a climate resilience um, experience. So this necessarily wouldn't be for elementary level um, students, but this is for seventh grade on up. And this is about like a 45 minute class where you would, you know, if you're in person, can use ID flashcards. Um, preserve specimens, but also you can just use the website. And what you would do is you'd break out students into um, these different groups as you see here. And what they would do is they would, um, and they could look up this critter, you know, as they're broken out into groups. So one's dragonfly group, one's cranefly group, one's midges, one's caddisfly, the case makers specifically, one's the mayfly group, and they would answer this question, what makes my tax and critter more or less resilient to climate change? And of course, before they would get into this, we'd have a discussion on climate resiliency, climate change, and freshwater systems. So we did this for our teacher project wet workshop, which went really well. We had um, a full presentation and discussion on those topics of climate resiliency and freshwater systems. And then we had the teachers, and you could do this with students, break out into these five groups, research maybe their tolerances, um, their sensitivities, what might make them, again, more or less resilient to climate change. And then we came back and discussed this. So that was really nice. And they gave their group reports and discussions. But again, um, back to elementary level students, in this case with fourth graders, we've, um, speaking of adaptations, we can talk about that specifically with fourth graders, but on up too. Um, but we've supported teachers in this specific topic with a 50 minute experience um, where we've done this in person in our education lab. And we have a series of activities which that go with this, including a field notebook that students in complete. Um, but students get a chance to see live macroinvertebrates. We've also, you know, placed pre-collected macroinvertebrates on tables with groups of students. Um, and they just simply look at how a macroinvertebrate moves. How do they survive? What are these adaptations? And um, then you assign each group one of these macroinvertebrates. And all these 
um, cards, quote unquote, are really 11 by 17 printouts that are on our resources site and you can use us in your own activity. Um, and there are a handful of different macroinvertebrates. So they see some live in their groups, then they get to dive deep into one in particular. And on the back of these, you'll see these print art printouts. Um, let me move here. <laughs> on the front, they have um, various images showed a particular macrovertebrate, mentioning some other adaptations. And on the back are life history and adaptation nuggets. So we put students again in teams, they learn about the particular macrovertebrate. And then eventually they're going to be called up to present this information to their classmates. We also, during this experience, have them complete this diagram of the mayfly um, during that time frame that goes deeper into adaptations. And we have them kind of do this um, sometimes before or after the experience. And we discuss what the tails are for, what are the gills for, and the legs, and so on. And you know, the image galleries from the site of the body characters are also so fun to use when teaching about adaptation. So those are available for you as well. So lastly, just a few extensions that we'd like to share relating to the website, one of which is the creation of 3D models of some of the taxa. So this is great. In this particular project, we worked with a local high school and their engineering program, as well as the 2D art students and teachers to create and paint the designs to 3D um, printed damselflies, mayflies, stoneflies, water pennies, crayfish, snails, planaria, hellgermites, and caddisflies. And students referenced macroinvertebrates.org for these morphological characters. So for their creation and painting the models, you know, to get them as accurate as possible. So, um, and now our education department uses these models in our, our programming and public um, you know, experiences and exciting for you. These nine files are available for you to print. Um, we won't print them and paint them for you, but you can certainly do this on your own if you visit this website called thingy with an I verse.com and just search for Stroudwater Research Center. You will find all of these files and you can get them printed out on 3D printer and have them painted yourself. Lastly, um, we'd like to mention um, that the Society for Freshwater Science, an international scientific organization who promotes the further understanding of freshwater ecosystems, has what's called a Taxonomic Certification Program, or TCP. And it's coordinated by one of our entomologists here at the Stroud Center, Mike Brumall, that you see here in this picture. Um, he's been on the design team for macroinvertebrates.org and has helped curate all the um, entomological information for each taxa. Um, and with this TCP program, there are several, several levels of certification that you can test for an aquatic macroinvertebrate ID, including a mid-level test, one for those EPT, family level, and more. And now there's a new volunteer level certification, which includes some families up to some phylum. So, all the TP certification exams are online with images and for a small fee and for a certain duration or time frame. And we're trying to launch this, you know, volunteer test. And so students could take this and have that as part of their grade. Um, it's nice to have as a resume builder, but also if you're a volunteer program wanting to use this um, as part of your QAQC, we'd be happy to speak with you about that. So you can contact, um, Mike Brumall, there's his email there to find out more about this test and how you can maybe bring this into your own worlds. And you can use um, the macroinvertebrates.org as a study um, support as well. And just to mention, macroinvertebrates.org is now a part of what is called the Wiki Watershed Toolkit of the Stroud Water Research Center. This is a web toolkit. Um, designed to help citizens, conservation practitioners, municipal decision makers, researchers, educators, and students advance knowledge and stewardship of fresh water. So please visit the site to explore all the other tools available. All right, so we're finished here and wanna thank you so much for watching. Please reach out to us if you should have any questions and if you'd like to submit feedback or ideas for the website, please um, go to this um, 
website that's listed at the top and provide that feedback to us. We'd be delighted to hear from you. All right, thank you so much again and have fun with the website.